Welcome to Interior Analysis. I'm Evan Westman. I am Jelani Kelly. And today we're talking about Spotlight, the uh, 2015 Best Picture winner. And actually, like, this is something that I think deserved to win Best Picture, which is, I don't want to say rare, but rarer than I'd like it to be. And just before we go further, like, trigger warning, just for content, if you've seen this, you probably know why. Probably also like a language warning, um, which shouldn't be the thing that turns you away, I think. But basically, like, don't listen to this with kids in earshot. I, if you haven't seen this, I don't know why you'd be listening anyway, but warning for that. So this was your first time watching it. Any initial reactions? Well, you knew it wasn't my genre, but... I did. I knew it might be not the most fun thing for you. Yeah. I mean, it's not the most fun thing for anyone, but, like, it's very much not a you movie. Yeah. I mean, I think it was important, like, what it brought to light. Because even I learned some things from it. Like, I thought it was a few bad apples, and we'll get into that later. But, like, I didn't realize it was that freaking many priests doing that. Like, I I've heard all the priest jokes and stuff like that about them doing what they were doing. I didn't realize it was as big as it was or is it's probably still going on. But other than it, like, not really being my speed... I was fine with it. Like I said, the subject matter is important. It's just one of those things I feel like people need to be educated on, whether it's fun mm. to watch or not. So um, I'm glad you made me watch it because, like I said, I learned a few things from it. Initial reactions, not too deep. I just had a few questions and just notes. We're going to immediately get into what was more my speed from the movies we have seen on the podcast. It's crazy how <laughs> yeah. many uh, actors that were in Marvel movies that are part of this it, main cast. It really is. And I looked into it. There's even more than I thought. Oh, God. Go, go ahead. <laughs> uh, so we got Mark Ruffalo, otherwise known as Hulk Guy. Rachel McAdams, who was Doctor Strange's GF in his movie. Michael Keaton, also known as the best Spider-Man villain so far that we've seen on screen, The Vulture. Um, and Batman. I know and, that's not well, Marvel, yeah, and but Batman. like also Batman. He was he was Batman or something something like that. <laughs> I know you don't like Batman, but yeah, people uh, know him for that. Yeah, more than the Vulture. he was like it's our it's he's still in the argument uh, running for like best Batman currently with mm -hmm. Bale and I don't hear Affleck as much, but I know some people are gunning for him. But that's not what this is about. Tony Stark's father. I don't know the actor's name. If yeah, John Slattery. That's I I thought if you said it I was gonna remember that name, but I don't. I always forget him too. He's normally always somebody's father. I'm surprised he wasn't a father in this. Yeah. He's always like vaguely unhelpful, I feel like, everything I've seen John Slattery and he's not like a bad guy, but he's like He's also kind of an ass. He like, is he's typecast like, as an asshole. But like not a bad guy and not like a huge asshole, just kinda yeah. like that self-centered he's just like the boss that like gets on you to do work basically in everything that he's in yeah Liv Schreiber he was Sabretooth in X-Men Origins Wolverine if you saw that movie bless your heart for watching it I loved it as a kid because Wolverine was like my favorite hero growing up, so it was just cool to see Wolverine in another action movie. I hated the Wolverine. Like I'd rather watch this is my sound blasphemous. I'd rather watch X Men Origins over the Wolverine. I can't stand when he loses his regeneration powers. But still, that's not what this podcast is about. I could go on and on yeah. about well, the, all to, types of was that the end of your list? Because there's actually two more. Oh, uh, who are the other two? We also have Stanley Tucci is the scientist that made Captain America Captain America. Oh! And then... They really do him justice with makeup. I can never tell when it's him. Like, if I didn't realize he yeah. was in the credits, I wouldn't have realized it was Stanley Tucci. And, yeah, when I saw you give that note, I was like, I should look that up, because Stanley Tucci's definitely been in a Marvel movie. But I just, like, I didn't think that was who he was, but he... That is him. Yep. And then also, Brian Darcy James is the actor. He plays Matt Carroll, the journalist with the mustache that doesn't get a lot of attention. He apparently 
is the president in Dark Phoenix, which came out after this. But that pretty m- oh, and also you have Doctor Manhattan, Billy Crudup, as uh, the lawyer. So like literally Jeez. every big character in this <laughs> is in a superhero movie. It's wow. quite a team up. Yeah, yeah. They didn't do any superpower things, in case you you guys were wondering. But let's move on to my next note. I know the actors have been in like plenty of other movies, but it's kind of weird. It was kind of weird to sit there and listen to them do Bostonian accents, or some of them do Bostonian accents, and the rest of them kind of just do normal American mm-hmm. accents. And everyone was like talking super fast. Like, really fast. Mainly Mark Ruffalo and Rachel McAdams. I was like, why? I know they're journalists, but why the hell are they talking so fast? It's a little weird. I mean, they have a lot of dialogue to get through. Like, the script yeah. is 140 pages, which, for this kind of movie, like, I think the runtime is 210, which is about as long as I think they could have made it. Because, like... Even, like, ten more minutes, I think, would have been a lot for people. I just assumed it was part of the journalist cliche about, like, talking fast and a lot to inform somebody on something and then ask them a question Mm -hmm. after. Like, it was weird. It's probably that, too. I mean, these people are are all portraying real people. So, I, I don't know how accurate their portrayals are. I've seen a couple interviews with some people. Mark was the most quirky guy. Like, I wonder whoever he was. Port- yeah. Mike, whoever he was portraying was like that in real life because he was by far the most non stoic character or person. Yeah, he and Rachel McAdams actually both got nominated for their performances. They didn't win. I think that's pretty fair. Like, I wouldn't have given them wins, but they did, they did well. Uh,. They were both for supporting, so I I don't remember. I want to say it was, like, Mark Rylance, and then uh, I don't know who won for Best Actress. Leo won for Best Lead Actor, but they weren't up against him. It was in The Revenant? Uh, was that his year? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, while we're on the, the Oscars, too, like, this had pretty good competition, and I think still deserved it. Like, this went up against Inside Out, and Ex Machina for Best Original Screenplay. Hey, we just watched that. Go watch that episode, too. Yeah, and, and like, both of those, are, I think, are phenomenal scripts that other years would have absolutely deserved to win. I think this, just in terms of technical writing, it's definitely more of an Oscars movie. Like, I would have been surprised yes. to see Ex Machina. Oscar as baby. good as it is, I would. it's not really an Academy movie. And then, like, this was up against some pretty good Best Picture nominees, like Mad Max Fury Road, which also would have been a surprising win, but really good movie. And then The Big Short was a big contender against this. I think The Martian was up that year, too. It was, like, a fairly solid year, but I remember when I saw this, I think I saw it after it won Best Picture, but I was like, yeah, well-deserved, which I don't always say back to the actors uh, it, it just felt forced somehow not everybody was entirely believable like ruffalo in his role like i could kind of see him like that like maybe towards the end for some reason like when he when he had that ex well i wouldn't say exciting but like dramatic climactic moment was when he was like arguing with the his head about pushing the story out now rather than waiting and waiting for the other newspaper to F it up, the Herald to F it up. But, like, after seeing him in only one role, which was the Hulk, it was weird to see see him, like, talk fast, bobbing his head every three seconds and all of that. <laughs> he does do that a lot. <laughs> Turning around sharply, like, ready, like, he's trying to crack his neck or something. It was... It was weird. But at the same time, paradoxically, the most believable, I'd say, was Liv Schreiber. Uh, And I said maybe because I've seen him in less movies slash media, like I only saw him as Sabretooth in the bad X-Men movie. Well, there's a lot of those, but in that bad Wolverine one, well, there's a couple of those too. In X-Men Origins Wolverine, 
And I said maybe because I've seen him in less movies slash media, but I've also seen Mark Ruffalo in the exact same amount of roles. So I was, I don't know. I don't know, man. Maybe because his character was more like down to earth and chill as opposed to quirky. Like Mark Ruffalo's yeah. Well, character. I I watched some interviews with the guy that he's portraying, Marty Baron, and like it's a pretty perfect impression. Like he doesn't look exactly like the guy does, but like the vibe is spot on for how he plays this. Mm. Cool. <laughs> so, uh, hearing the stories, let's get a little more serious now. Hearing the stories, I'm glad they didn't sugarcoat any of them. I guess it was to bring spotlight to the to the situations, which is the name of the movie and the name of the the team. So that was good that they didn't they they didn't shy away from any of the the victims' gruesome details. Didn't expect nine eleven to be in this. Didn't consider when this movie or when the events from this movie happened. So that was a shocker. Yeah, I really liked the way they used. 9-11 in this which is kind of a weird thing to say but like it is used to a very good dramatic purpose like we'll we'll get into it a little later but like it has a real significance on it and it's like it's just such a testament to like this is still happening and also like i mean i don't remember 9-11 but everyone like more than a like couple years older than us three and a half yeah, so, like, we're a little young to remember 9-11, but even we know how big it is. Like, of course everything would stop there, but it doesn't make the story any less important to tell. So I I really liked how they used it. I questioned, I had a couple questions, like, why not a normal documentary over a movie? Did they really want the Oscar? I doubt it. There There had to be some reason why it wasn't a documentary. Maybe they thought if it was a movie for more people would watch it. I think that's a valid point. I have a couple possible answers. One, I, I there may be a documentary about this. I don't really know. Oh. I haven't looked for one. There may not be also. I would say there's maybe two possible reasons why. One is this got a lot more attention than I think a documentary would have. Yes if it gets awards attention like people at least are like oh maybe that's worth seeing and you know it'll stay out it stays out in theaters a little longer when it's up for awards which you know that i think helped also just because of the nature of the investigation like there's definitely no footage i would think of this actually happening Mm. and also think about like who could they interview they probably can't interview victims they probably aren't going to get that many priests to interview you also got to think of the quality of the footage as well. Like, this would have... If it was a documentary, it probably would have been out sooner, no? Yeah, yeah, that's probably true, too. I mean, this this got big media coverage immediately after, so I would guess that, like, if there were going to be a documentary, it would have been made, like, just after the... Like, as the story was being exposed, like, throughout 2002. Mm-hmm. But, I mean, I don't know what kind of restrictions that would place on it but i would guess that if they did a documentary it would probably just be interviews with the same characters we see in this and maybe that's why we really stick with them because maybe even the people who made this couldn't necessarily get testimonies from other people involved it's possibility i don't know if that's true would you have preferred a documentary no you think no. Only time I've ever watched documentaries is for school. Yeah, I'm pretty much the same with that. I didn't get the part where they didn't, like, the reason why they didn't run the story years ago. Like, they had the information there, ready to go, and they didn't run it before. It was like that intense scene where it's like, why didn't we run the story before? And then somebody gave, gave a one-sentence answer. I was like, oh, I guess, I guess they just answered it. But it's... 9 a.m. and I'm not willing to go back for that. I'm tired. <laughs> well, the I think the whole point of the movie in a lot of ways is that there isn't really a good answer to that question. Not the whole point, but we'll get into that later, but there really is not a good answer to your question there. Like Laziness. Uh, yeah, 
or you know your Fear. kind of irresponsibility this yeah we'll we'll definitely get into that My dog later it. um <laughs> yeah that would not have flown at the end it said the priests were accused but did nobody go to jail for molestation of minors it just said they were accused ain't nobody was in court like bro what the church had lawyers on deck or something like what the hell i i haven't checked but i think it's possible that they weren't um or maybe it took a while like, like it, and cases like this keep coming up at like in in the years since so you, you think like, it would have like you, you saw they did that uh information scroll thing at the end like every based on a true story movie does like mm-hmm. this happened nobody was harmed in the making of well they don't say that normally but like it said <laughs> so and so number priests were accused and then it didn't say anybody about anything about anybody being sentenced or, or going to jail like they, these people were just like hey you touch kids he was like well i did okay have a nice day like what what the hell happened there i would expect maybe some were sentenced or arrested whatever but i don't know i i don't have a good answer to that maybe i should look that where's up where's the while we're doing facts this, evan give me give me the car facts evan. the ending was good with all those people coming forward that was really cool that was a really cool ending really good way to end it like it's definitely not gonna be a sequel or anything but like it was uh, uh well i don't know oh jesus christ because <laughs> uh, well, no, for for real, like, Mike Rosendi's is, in real life, is still kind of looking into this stuff. I heard an interview with him, like, a month ago, I'm just call randomly. Spotlight 2, light, bright, lighter, lighter, bright, what? No, um, but, well, because he does I don't think any of the people in this work for it anymore, but he's, he, like, Mike Rosendi's in real life is still looking into this stuff. He had, like, an article him. that he did like a month ago about like the church getting bailout money for covid because like they were able to apply as a small business or something i don't know exactly really? what the point of it was the church a small business well i think what happened with it is and maybe i should link to the article i'd have to go find it again but i think it's something about how because each parish is kind of considered its own thing like they can oh, kind God. of say okay. they're they're all individual small businesses yeah. mm-hmm. and like there's something about their money they're getting bailed out with being used to like pay victims and like pay their settlements and i don't know whether that's supposed to be bad or something like that they're not supposed to be doing that ethically or whatever but i i know mike Rosendi's just did an article about that like literally within the past two months all right I don't know if that really gives any answer nope. to that question, but it at least is. I think it was good. You know, people calling, great, perfect way to end it. And that that's it. I was I put a thing down for later reactions, but I I didn't have any later reactions. Like, okay. I didn't really think about the movie past what I wrote the day I saw it, which wasn't today for once. You you told me to watch it in advance, so I did. Yeah. Yeah, it it deserves to have a couple days to sit on it. Like that worked pretty uh perfectly for when we did Pirates Three, but uh okay. not yeah, I don't think no. that would have been good to do for this. No, don't talk about Pirates and Spotlight in the same podcast, Evan. Episode Probably shouldn't. Blast um, <laughs> A little bit. Yeah, so just before we get into our topics, like just since this is based on a true story and like I have, like, a little bit of personal experience with this, and before anyone thinks about it, like, this is not a victim story, it's just I live, like, I have grown up Catholic, I live near Boston, at least, well, I've moved around, but my family's based in Boston, so I'm more familiar with there than, like, any other area, so, like, maybe that's a little bit of, like, bias for why I, to say I like it is a little bit, I do like it, but... 
I also kind of like get the vibe of it and the whole world of it a little more than I think some people would just because of my like proximity to it. But as I was going back through this, I thought it was worth putting this in. Like I have heard recently about priests that I know who like have broken celibacy, not with kids, like with other adults and they're not abusive, but you know, they fit the pattern of like, you know, I think there's a stat in there. So I at least have some kind of... Priests aren't supposed to do that? They're not supposed to marry. And that's... I don't know how how universal that is for Christianity, because I know, like, some pastors, it's totally fine. Oh, that's not, that's not the case. Well, at least the churches I've been to, almost all of them have wives. Yeah, I don't know which denominations, like, allow that and which don't, but... Roman Catholicism is absolutely like if you are in religious life, you can be you can be a deacon and be married, but that's not the same thing. I'm not the best person to tell you about it, but like the celibacy rule is hard and fast. Like if you are a priest, you do not marry. And same goes for nuns, but that's not really there's no focus on that for this. But and I I don't know any nuns also. So would you um, say the amount of nuns, you know, is none? Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm sorry. I'm trying to lighten the mood of that just just a little bit. I know it's a really I know it's a serious topic. I'm sorry. That's fine. So that list at the end, I like paused it and looked through it. The places? The all the places, yeah. Like my family has lived near several of the cities on that list. Not like in them necessarily, but within an hour. And mm-hmm. like this story came out when I was pretty little, but I did start wondering, like, how close was I to any priests? Like, do I know priests that were abusive, like, that I met in the past? Do I know kids that, like, I went to school with who were maybe abused? Nothing confirmed, but I did start to wonder about it. And, you know, this investigation came to light, again, when I was, like, I think, like, three years old. So my entire time in school it's been people have been a little more aware of it but even so i don't mean to like scare people with that but it is something i've been thinking about since going back to this and also like my parents both grew up outside of boston that priest that they mentioned like the first major case father porter he actually Mm -hmm. served like he used to work in the church that my dad went to as a kid not when my dad was there but Like, the real Father Porter? The real Father Porter, yeah. Jesus. Yeah, and, like, I I remember, because I I went and saw this in theaters with my dad, and on the way home, he was, like, telling me about it, like, because he didn't grow up in Boston, but it was close enough, and, like, he didn't really know about it, because he was, of course, pretty little when when it was happening, and he wasn't there when Father Porter was, but, like, I remember that really did make it feel kind of real to me. It, it is that many. And this, of course, is like a big thing that comes up in Catholicism in general now. And I don't think as a lay person from Catholicism, like not to say that there's not a bad reaction to it, but I think if you stay, you can't be blamed for that. If you leave, you can't be blamed for that. Like I respect both choices because in some ways if you're not okay with like the hierarchy of the church and how they've acted through this, like absolutely. I don't think anyone could judge you for not being okay with that and not feeling comfortable, like bringing your kids to church after you find this out. Like if anyone blames you for that, I think they're wrong. Like also on the other side of it, like I think it's also like fine for people to stay after they hear about it because the church is not just priests and like it's about it can be like a major source of hope for people which is part of why this issue is so bad because it kind of robs people of that mm. but i think some people will ask like how could you leave just because of this or how could you stay in the church after you find this out i think there are just justifiable reasons for both and they seem to kind of you know all the journalists in this are like lapsed catholics but it doesn't go after, like, the church 
teachings, which is, it's important to do, I think, because it, it's focusing on a very, like, I was kind of surprised when I first saw this that it didn't go after the church as much, because I was kind of expecting that. And of course, like, it doesn't paint the church in a very great light, but it's not being, like, anti-religion in any way, which I think is is kind of an important thing to do. So let's get into our first topic here. So it's the world of the story, which is Boston Catholicism. So, you know, we've talked about world building a little bit on the show, and this is not, of course, world building, but it is important to the story, I think, that they give a good sense of what the setting of Boston and its relationship to the church is like, because it's, it's a pretty important thing that runs throughout it. Everyone in Boston that the people talk to are like sort of afraid of the church and some people are like very willing to defend it. Like it's one of the more Catholic cities in the country. Might even be the most. I don't know exact stats, but I know it's up there. Just from like watching this as someone who's not from Boston or are are you not Catholic? No, I'm not Catholic. Just as being not Catholic and being not from Boston, did you feel like lost in on anything, or like did it? Did you get a good sense of it? You felt like I really. I mean, I went to Catholic church one time because I. Had well, but to... did I, I? I was asking like from what this movie showed. Did you feel like you got a good sense of like what, what the world of the story was? Oh yeah. Okay. But I also went to Catholic church one time. I'm just going to say it wasn't for me. Yeah, Fair too. enough. Yeah, but I think it's it's an important thing for the movie to show, both for people in Boston, and of course the majority of the people watching this aren't going to be familiar with it. And there's a very strong sense of, like, people in Boston do not speak ill of the church. We're kind of beaten over the head with that, but it is sort of important to beat us over the head with it because it is giving that sense of, like, if this story gets out, it's going to be bad for them. And, you know, they they give some examples from the past, too. But also, you know, they give the stat, 53% of the readership of the globe is Catholic. And we see several per peripheral characters that are. And the victims in the scenes that they have those interviews, they talk about, like, religion was really important. Like, the church was big in my family. And even, like, the reporters are all, like, they all grew up Catholic. It's a big part of the city. Also, there's the sense that Boston functions a little more like a small town. There's a couple characters that note that. And I think they... And they they, they, they fall... portray it like a small town. Mm -hmm. Like, the only thing I see on the outside is the damn... Like, everything else is taking place inside. You're inside the courthouse. You're inside the... The globe itself, inside a restaurant. The only time I saw the outside was in the suburb-looking area with that one dude that lived down the street from the priest, the dude with the stash. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I mean, Boston's not a... It's a populated city, but geographically it's a very small city. And, you know, it's, it's very old, too. Also not so a it... crazy lot of people walking the street like New York, for example. That might have been just a budget thing with them shooting. No, it, it I looks... mean, in real life, when I went to Boston, like, there ain't that many people out. You haven't been to the same parts or the same times as, uh, as I've been to Boston then. You Maybe there's two different crowded. Bostons than Evan. Hmm? Maybe I went to Boston 1 and you went to Boston 2. Maybe. Maybe it right. might have just been timing, too, because I tend to go there when it's, like, good weather. People you went in, like, the winter, out. so that also might have been a part of it. It was either fall or winter. Yeah, Boston gets really cold in the winter. So, yeah, that might have been part of it. So, yeah, it's a, it's a very insider culture that they show, though. Like, they mention it, but they also show it. Like, there's many people that come up where some character's like, oh, I know that guy, like, personally. And, I mean, from living in New England, I can tell you that is absolutely the experience like everyone kind of knows everyone which i don't know how true that is of other cities but it's it's true up here who are you um in new england yeah literally like i'll i'll meet like if you meet someone 
in Rhode Island, which, you know, this isn't Rhode Island, but it's close. Like, if you meet someone who lives there, they know someone you know. It might not come up immediately, but they absolutely know someone you know. I don't know who you are. What is this? (laughs) Well, you're not from Rhode Island, so. You don't know where I'm from. I'm from Earth, Evan. Get it right. Get right. I mean, same, but that's, yeah. I think they also do a good job of portraying, like, Boston-type people. Like, it's kind of a rougher city, like, not necessarily in terms of, like, high crime rate or whatever. I don't know where it sits on that. It wasn't the accents. They did not portray that. Uh, It's better than some. It's not Matt Damon, but it's not Kevin Costner either. Kevin Costner does a terrible Boston accent in this one movie. I thought a couple of them were a little iffy. One of the victims, I thought, did probably the best one. The one that Resendiz talks to, um, Mark Ruffalo. I thought his was pretty good. Yes. But, like, some of the people in this just feel very Boston, and it's like... In the car. Yeah, in the car. Going to Baja. Yeah. It's it's a stereotype, but it's a very real stereotype. (laughs) Park the car and have it yet. Yep. You will you will absolutely hear that sentence said just like that. I had to say it at least once over the course yeah. of this podcast. There was no just avoiding wait. that. Yeah, just wait until we get to Goodwill Hunting, dude. Matt Damon's Boston accent. Oh. I love it. It's I good or bad. It. Oh, it's great. I love Matt Damon doing a Boston accent is all you need to get me to a movie. He's not in more than, like, three movies where he does a Boston accent, but, like, I'll watch something because it because of that at face value. Spider-Man 4 with Tobey Maguire and Matt Damon doing a Boston accent. <laughs> oh, my God. I, that would actually be an enjoyable thing. I thought you were going to be torn. I mean, I'm sure it would still be pretty bad, but if Matt Damon's in it doing a Boston, that'd work. <laughs> it's Tobey Maguire, I mean. It's Toby McGuire, but it's Matt Damon doing a Boston accent. I would I would pay to watch that. Instead um, of James Franco playing Harry. He's oh, like yeah. Harry too or something. <laughs> yeah. Matt Damon is a Spider Man villain. Let's do it. The Bostonian. One other thing that and this will come up a bit later too, but that was important, I think, to the world of the story is like how much people keep saying like the church does a lot of good here. But I think a counterpoint to that that again this will come up more later like that's a very strong sentiment that runs throughout the city but a question that i think has to get asked is how many victims does it take before that becomes an invalid excuse and i don't really have an answer to that but i think it absolutely passes that point like the scale that we see here and like one incident of course is too small because that literally is the bad apple argument but, you know, I don't know what that number is, but I think that's something that it's not mentioned. It's not even really implied at, but I think it's it's a question that eventually comes up. So that kind of leads us into the next topic, which is like how they expose the issue. And we'll talk a little bit about accuracy in this, too. Um, so what did you know? You may have already answered this, but what did you know about like the whole clergy abuse scandals prior to watching this whether like true or false things just that it was happening or it was supposedly happening and i just believed it it's been talked about in all sorts of media tv shows comedy tv shows like south park and family guy have probably done stuff on it. i'm not gonna specify anything but stuff like that it's mentioned in rap songs all the time or any song talking about something profound or even making a joke out of it, it might do that. It's pretty much like I, I've gotten knowledge from it all over, but nothing like that focused in on it. Yeah. And it's it's a little too bad that like we I mean, I guess it's kinda of nothing to do about it, but like I wonder whether that was happening before this case happened, like before like this journalistic piece came out because I don't know how many people knew about it and were like talking about it freely like that, even 
just like making a joke about it prior to this story coming to light i mean it's pretty clear that people knew about it but like were people talking about it i don't know i was just curious to hear that i don't really remember what i knew about this issue before seeing it i knew i knew it was a thing i don't remember from where one thing i'll say you know again i can't speak to how it was talked about before but i can say that like as someone who's gone through catholic school when it would come up in like religion classes which didn't happen often but you know they can't really ignore it anymore so there's usually like a bit in religion books where they'll be like yes we are aware this happens they don't deny that it happens but they're like the church is not okay with this we do not condone it i don't know whether I've heard that from, it's probably a mix of like religion books and religion teachers. I think that answer is both true and untrue because it's absolutely true that like the church does not like condone any of this in terms of teachings. There's nothing in the Bible that justifies this at all, which kind of goes without saying, but like, it's not as if this is part of Catholic teaching However, the church hierarchy, as is shown in this investigation, kind of does condone this. And there are people who can separate the two. So when someone says the church does not condone this, they aren't lying. Like, they are being accurate in some ways. However, there is an extent to which that isn't true. Because they're, at the same time, they're protecting the priests? Yeah, so it it depends on what, it it really depends on when you say, does the church condone this? Who do you mean by the church? Do you mean, like, Catholicism's teachings? Because then the answer is no. Do you mean, like, the Pope, bishops, and all that? And the answer may not be yes across the board, but the people who the answer is yes for win out most of the time. So it's not as clean cut. And again, like, I think it's okay to be able to separate the two, and it's okay to not be able to separate the two. Just, it's kind of an individual thing. In terms of accuracy, I didn't do, like, a ton of research into this, but I watched some interviews with the real journalists about this, and they kind of confirmed that they're like, yeah, little bits of this are dramatized, but for the most part, like, it's pretty accurate. And... I was kind of surprised at some of the things that they confirmed. I don't remember specifics, but I would have thought this was a little more dramatized than it was. But apparently it's it's pretty true to life. Um, even that ending scene, which comes off maybe as a little bit like more something you'd see in like a fictional movie, that that's pretty accurate. Like they got a lot of phone calls that first day. They were surprised that there weren't picketers and they got tons of calls from victims like right away so even though it might look i i I wouldn't have expected that that was necessarily true i i would have expected that that was sort of just nodding to the impact it had but i think it's it's actually close to literally true and also like the victims i haven't looked into this exactly either but i would expect that the victim characters in this are not like really real people I would expect they're more like summary characters that are there to just kind of just summarize like what most victims experience was. So it might like they're probably not based off of individual people that they talk to. It's just kind of like giving the sense of this is the sort of like trauma that most victims went through. And I think that's a better decision than trying to be accurate. One for privacy and two just because this is not really so much about accuracy as it is about informing people. I think it was a good decision. Going off of that too, like, I agree with you that I think they did a good job not sugarcoating the victims' stories. Like, they let the abuse speak for itself, but I think an equally important choice in that was that they also don't overdo it and make it too dramatic and, like, have people like bawling in those scenes and also they show the the victims as adults like i think it would have been a more like i think a more obvious idea is to like 
Yep, the kids. Yeah, with kids. Like there are there are no kids in this movie. You mean as far as like important characters? Because there is like the choir Mike was looking at, and yeah. Mm-hmm. And but like I think that I I think the way that they include just like little peripheral kids in this is kind of brilliant because it's all you need. Like I think there's that moment. There's a scene like right after Sasha uh, goes and talks to one of the priests, like the that she interviews, and like right after there's a couple kids that ride by on their bikes, and you know it's a tiny moment, but it does all it needs to. It's like oh man this is like the danger is right around the corner and i think that those little moments are even more powerful than like any scene that would have nodded to that i think it's a really good choice for writing it and also again like if they had a scene like showing a priest actually abusing a kid i I think one that kind of throws off the tone of the movie two I feel like that would just be sort of gratuitous and three, which I think this is the most important thing. It it doesn't give you the whole picture. The major thing that the interview scenes focus on is like how these people are still traumatized as adults, which you absolutely can't infer that from scenes where you're talking to kids about it. Mm -hmm. So I thought that was a, a really good choice to do that. Because it's showing, like, this is psychological, like, intense psychological trauma that these people go through. And also, like, I think the score is kind of important in that, too. Because it might have been tempting to have, like, a really emotional, dramatic score under some of those interview scenes. And I I don't think there's any score in those scenes. And what what music we have is pretty low-key like it's just kind of it's background music it's not like intense it's not supposed to evoke emotion and i think it it would have been tempting in a lot of cases to try to do a little more with the score and i'm really glad that they don't because i think that would really lend the wrong tone to it one other thing that it seemed i thought seemed pretty effective for exposing the issue was the structure of the story like a lot of the characters at the beginning are kind of like writing off the issue a little bit in a way that i think is kind of similar to some of the things people tend to think about with this they're just like oh it's just a few priests look at how much good the church does is it everyone no it's just like a few people and the whole progression of the investigation in this gradually breaks down all of those arguments and i would think that's probably fairly accurate to the characters like the real people involved in this but in terms of like exposing this issue to the audience i think it's absolutely important that they include those moments where people are kind of like saying that this is like people are being paranoid or whatever like like you said this is i don't want to put words in your mouth but it sounds like you feel like you got pretty well educated by this i absolutely feel that for better or for worse most of my knowledge about this issue comes from this movie but it seems like they did a good job with like being accurate about it whether in fact or just in telling you this is what this is about so the next is kind of about like making it dramatic and i kind of want to say entertaining like because it's not like a fun movie to watch it's just people sitting in rooms talking but for a movie of people sitting in rooms talking it's like very engaging and before we get into that like i really want to applaud like their choice of designing principle for this because it feels like there are just so many bad versions of this movie that they could have made one would have been like the over the top HBO version where they really show like the graphicness of the abuse, which I really don't think would have been a good move. They could have had like a legal drama where it was more like them suing the church for the documents and that kind of thing. That doesn't feel like the right move. I think they could have also made like more of a feel good version of this where it's like, yeah, we're going to like beat the bad guys with this one. I don't know that that's accurate Two. 
I, and I think that's like the tempting version for them to make. Like that just feels like something that might have been a little bit more of an obvious choice and making the journalists like more heroic. And I really appreciate that they didn't do that. They also could have done more focus on the church and made them like a bunch of mustache twirling villains. I think that would have been a tempting choice. Like as it is, we see about three priests in this movie total. And I don't even know if all of them are even given names. And that's kind of remarkable considering that it's all about priests. Mm. And the, well, there's two other movies that I think are pretty similar to this that I just want to compare to. One is Doubt, which I just watched this past week, and I was I was really surprised about it because like that also is it's fictional, it's about pol- clergy abuse, but it's also very very different in the way it's framed. So and also like the context of it was kind of confusing to me because it takes place in the '60s. It was written in 2004 and came out in 2008. So that's written after this all, like the whole investigation came out, but before this movie was around. But it also takes place well before the investigation or any of like the smaller cases that they talk about in this came to light. So it was very odd watching it. But the the whole thing that they do with it in that movie, like the word abuse, the word molestation, and like anything like that, those are never said, but there's like a subtext that runs through the whole thing. And it's not a bad movie, but I, I think that was just something that was made around the same issue before Spotlight came out. So I don't really know if there's a point I'm trying to make with that, but this is just a very different type of story like even though they're about the same issue they don't really play into each other that much i guess and the version of this that i am maybe most glad they didn't make is one that was more similar to the post did you see that no is that tom hanks and meryl street yeah and tom hanks's character in that is actually like the real life father to the John Slattery character in this, Ben Bradley and Ben Bradley Jr. Just a little fun fact there. But that was really, like, I think they were trying to be Spotlight for, like, the Watergate issue, which Mm. all the President's Men already exists. I I don't really know what they were trying to go for with that, but that was something that was trying to just be more, like, feel-good and, like, yeah, journalists are, like, great or whatever, and... Didn't the Triangle... The Triangle tried to go see that movie, right? That is when I saw it. I didn't know if you came to that. Nope. Yeah, well, you didn't miss much in terms of the actual movie, but I just am so glad they didn't make the post version of this, where they try to make it a lot more, like, dramatic. Triumphant and Mm -hmm. good versus evil. Yeah, there's this really cheesy shot at the end of that where, like, Tom Hanks and Meryl Streep are, like, watching the presses run and being like, we did a good job, didn't we? And, like, that just... I mean, it graded on me in that it absolutely would have wrecked Spotlight if they made, like, a moment like that. I I think that really was not the right move. And they, you know, they do make it seem like... These people are heroes, like, these journalists in this, I think. The ending made that clear. Right, but they don't give him, like, a pat on the bat moment. Like, they won a Pulitzer for this, and that is not mentioned in the end title cards. Which, like, I feel like any other version of this, they would have put that in there. Like, they would have shown them getting the Pulitzer in, like, the, you know, end title thing. You know, not to discredit them, but I think it's really good that that's not what they focused on there. The focus is... This is not just Boston. This is happening in a town near you. Closest state to me was New York, but I don't even I don't even recognize the town. Uh, Philly's on the list. Sorry to tell you. I don't know if there's anything in Jersey on it's there. Two hours away. Yeah. I mean, not trying to scare you. Just it, it it might be a little closer geographically than you think. There's a lot of cities on there. Now I'm spooked. So the next topic within this is exposition. So obviously. This movie is, like, all exposition, which is usually the most boring part of any movie that you you try to get through as quick as you can. 
But I think they they did a lot of things right for doing the exposition of this. For one thing, they keep a lot of the exposition scenes pretty quick. Did they? I I thought a lot of them, yes. And there's a good conflict to it also. Like, getting this information for them is really hard in a lot of cases. They're having to dig for sources and... You know, that scene where Mike's at the courthouse trying to get the papers, like, he has to spend, like, all night there or whatever. It's, like, it's a real hassle for them to get this stuff, which I think makes us more invested in it because we're like, all right, come on, I want to find out this. Like, why are, you, why are you putting it off? Which, you know, I think is probably pretty true to their experience trying to find this stuff. But it also is good for us as the audience. And one of the most important things that this does, I think, is, you know, almost every scene there's like new facts that come to light but some of them are just kind of little things and some of them are like holy shit facts like i think the phrase holy shit is in the script in action lines like 12 times to kind of give a sense like everything else they just said is like still important but not really this is the big thing yes and it really comes across in the performances like there's a few moments where they're like wait is that that can't be right. That's right. And oh, with the numbers, mm-hmm. the, numbers the numbers, especially they were like 90. What do you mean 90? Yeah, that that scene, like any time I watch it somehow, like I'm still surprised by that whole thing. Like, just <gasps> here's that scene. They're like 90. <laughs> 90. You know, it, it, they really mean 90. Well, but like, it's, it, it's just, it's just such a big difference. I think, it, I, I don't think it's necessarily the number 90 in that scene. It's that they know about 13. They're like, oh, 13 would be big. And it's mm-hmm. six times bigger, which is insane. Yes. And, you know, the scale of it is a major thing with this too. Like they start off looking at maybe two priests and like, that's all they're looking at at first. Like, I don't think there's that much of a sense early on that, there are more you know there's a sense like oh the church hierarchy knew about this let's look into that but then all of a sudden they discover like whoa this runs way deeper this guy gagan is one of like 87 priests in boston that we also need to tell people about and yeah 97 90 some other good techniques i think it does a subtly good job using the settings to give information. Like there's the contrast between Stanley Tucci and Billy Crudup's office. So Garabedian and McLeish, those two characters, like Um, one's really small and like he's swimming in boxes. And the other one with Billy Crudup is like all glass, really nice, like marble floors and everything. And it's, small i didn't notice it the first time i saw it but i think it does register that like the bad guys are winning and the good guys are being stopped here i know it's maybe i it's not really fair to say it that binary of a sense but it sort of wants you to get that impression that like mitch garabedian is trying to really do his job and he's getting nowhere he has no money basically and billy crudup is profiting off of like child abuse basically not directly but pretty much and he's you know he's living it up so i thought that was a good technique also this is something that i think is normally not a good exposition technique but in this case it is they say a lot of information twice when it's important like they'll mention it in one scene and then they'll mention it in the next one and in most like books and classes that have taken the they'll tell you like don't repeat information because the audience will get it in this case when the entire thing is information you want to repeat the stuff that you want people to remember especially because so much of it is going to go in one ear and out the other so is that why tinker tinker taylor soldier spy was twice the length it needed to be probably i hated that movie i hate that I never fall asleep in class, and that was the one of the only times in college that I did. I'm sorry. Side note. No, that's a, that's a that's a good comparison though. Like, because of course that's a very different kind of movie, but it is 
pretty much all like a guy searching talking. around for facts talking, talking. In rooms. it was one gunshot in the beginning and then one gunshot at the end i was expecting a spy movie and i got a talking spy movie i'm sorry i i well i don't think it's an unfair comparison like because most of the time just as a general writing technique you don't want your characters just sitting in rooms talking that's what they teach us that's what they teach. That's what they embedded in our brains, Evan. Yep. Show, don't tell. Mm-hmm. There should be more action than dialogue. All of that. All yeah. of that. And Evan. And and most of the time, that's absolutely true. I think it was a good instinct. And there is showing in this movie. It's very subtle, but it, it's there. Like, one scene that I always notice that with is when they're finding the... Um, I can't remember what the books are called, but those books that have like the lists of priests and where they've been reassigned. And they're in that dark basement and there's like, the, they're like, where does that smell coming from? It right is kind of subtle, kind of not, but it shows like this has been buried. Like nobody comes down here. And this is where like one of their biggest findings is the church has really tried to bury this. That's your example of showing, not telling. Yeah. And you know, does that register with everyone maybe maybe not like maybe not consciously but it's it's still a good tactic to use doesn't mean you have to do something like that with every scene but i think it's a it's a good writing lesson to take away from this and also pacing like i think this is just like impeccably paced do you i i really do like one thing that i think often is sort of the key to pacing is like every scene's length should kind of be proportionate to how important it is i think that's pretty much true in this i haven't like gone and done math on it or whatever but it feels that way and you always kind of feel the momentum of the investigation like for the first half hour they're just kind of like plodding through it they're like oh this is interesting this is interesting and then phil saviano comes in he's the first victim they talk to and they're like, oh, wow, this is, like, maybe bigger than we thought. Let's keep looking. But they still have some reservations, so they're like, all right, let's, like, we're, we're locked in, but, like, maybe we aren't going full steam ahead. And then they hear the 90, and after that scene, it's, like, full steam ahead for a little bit. And then 9-11 happens, and everything stops. Like, I think the pacing of the scenes and how long they are does a really good job giving a sense of that. And like I said earlier, the way 9-11 stops everything, it's just kind of a feeling that I think you get as an audience member, but that is still giving you a sense of, like, this is so much harder, and now, you know, it's 9-11. Everyone is upset about it. Nobody wants to hear this kind of story right after that. And Mm -hmm. they mention that, but they also kind of subtly give you that feeling and I like I don't think that's an accident. I think that is a writing technique. And I don't know if there's a lesson to take away from this because, I mean, feel free to build or disagree with me on this, but pacing to me is just kind of an instinct. There's not really like, oh, you know, people will say, don't make a scene longer than three minutes or whatever, but that's not always... Oh, yeah, that's all nonsense. There's a truth there's, there's, to there's, it. There's no set scientific number for pacing scenes out like you kind of just gotta feel it out Mm -hmm. it's what run throughs and edits are for so yeah but it's an it's an important thing because you don't want to spend 10 minutes on something that isn't really that important royale with cheese (laughs) royale oh god yeah that's that's maybe a bit of a counter example but it's it's an important thing and i think this movie does it really really well another thing they do which is more of a tactic that i think can be taken as less of an instinct and more of a rule to do a lot of scenes will lead into each other when they can like they'll end one scene and someone gets a phone call that leads into the next one or is like hey you're uh you're going to talk to that guy right yep okay and Again, that's not always a good thing to do in other things because you don't necessarily have to set up like, 
oh, I'm going to go talk to this person. All right, great. Good luck talking to that guy and then show them talking to it. A lot of times you can just show it. In this, I I think it's a good instinct when there's so many characters and so much information saying like, you know, when, when you, I, th this is another like strategy that I think they use really well. They'll use a character's name right before they show up. Like, when Mike is going to talk to Mitch Garabedian, they'll say something about Mitch Garabedian, and you're like, oh, wait, who's that guy? And then it shows Stanley Tucci, and the next one is like, okay, right, that's who he is. Yeah, so those are just some good writing techniques that can be taken from this. Next thing, this shouldn't take too long, but I do want to talk for a minute about the characters. So this is absolutely not a character story, but we do get some like little moments with the characters and they feel specific and like distinct from each other and i really like that it it hits each of them on a personal level matt has the rehab center right on his block so like that really is kind of like it gives him stakes for this and Sasha has her Catholic grandmother that she's kind of like, oh, when this comes out, it might get a little, she's not going to be happy about it. And Mike is kind of struggling with thinking maybe he would want to go back to the church someday. And now he's like, that is, I, I just can't. And they give a little time to that. And then Robbie, I thought, had the best personal stakes where we find out he actually buried the story years back when they got the um it might have been the porter case it might have been a different one but i like that they acknowledge that both because it gives a fair shake to everyone involved but it also you know it makes everyone feel a little more real they also never answered why he did that but sure well be and again like there's not really an answer to that he he says in that scene like yeah i did it i don't remember doing it but i did so i'm responsible for this in in some ways i'm gonna put a pin in that for a sec because that's gonna come up a bit in the next topic just one last note with that like i think the performances really help like if you'd made this with a bunch of nobody actors i don't think we would have cared about any of the characters i don't think we would have remembered everyone like it does kind of help that you can just be like there's the stanley tucci character like, being able to recognize the actors kind of does help. And also, like, they give good performances here. Not, like, stellar, but they're they're what they need to be. They're low-key in most places, and they're, they're not distracting from it either way. They're not distracting from it by being too good at playing these characters and making them feel, like, too distinct, but they're also making them feel like real people, so they don't feel Mark, wooden. Mark Ruffalo. Mark Ruffalo is a little bit more quirky than he needs to be, I think. But, yeah, I don't know how true that is to the real guy. Mark Ruffalo's. Okay, so, and this is where we're going to get back to that point you just brought up. Um, so this is the last thing we're going to talk about, which is the theme of social responsibility. So the theme, in my eyes, is the line from Stanley Tucci, if it takes a village to raise a child, it takes a village to abuse one. Yeah, that line was crazy. Yeah. Well, do you agree with it? Not entirely. I just thought it was cool to, like, reverse it. But looking back at it and, like, trying to analyze it, that doesn't make much sense because it all it takes is one person to abuse another person, to be honest. So. Well. Was he talking? I, I guess he was talking about, like, abusing. I don't know. I don't know. I I'm hoping I can, like, kind of bring you around to it, because I think it really is proven by everything that this movie shows. I don't think I noticed that the first time I saw it. I, I really think it is the, the driving theme of this movie. So, which institution or, like, group do you feel like gets the most blame or is painted the worst in this, if any of them? Institution? Yeah. Like, like the church, the lawyers, the journalists i don't think there's any others that would be in it or I, I guess regular people the church you think it actually paints the church the worst out of all of them yeah they're the ones that got the people touching the kids i mean fair enough like i i, I mean of course it starts with them 
honestly, when I saw it the first time, I kind of felt like it was a little bit harsher to the lawyers than anyone else, which was surprising to me. Watching it this time, I kind of feel like it, it pretty much gives a fair shake to everyone. Like, the first time you see it, I don't think it feels like the reporters get as mu- as many knocks in, but as I was looking at it, they do acknowledge a lot of times, like, hey, we heard about this, we heard about that, we heard about this, and, like, Phil Saviano and a couple other people say, like, why didn't you guys do anything? I sent you this stuff, and you buried it, you know? Why Why did this not come up sooner? Oh, that was a snaps guy, or a snap guy. You, you've asked it a couple times. Again, I don't think there's a good answer for why didn't this come out sooner. Because, you know, it, like, there are reasons, but not necessarily good ones like the the point of the movie to me is not like i kind of went into it expecting it to be more like child abuse is terrible will be the point of the movie and it's really not it's more the point is like how was this allowed to happen for as long as it did why didn't we notice sooner and it it pretty much points all of that out it's like the lawyer's covered everything up by saying like you know sign this nda whatever and the church kind of acted like you know we'll we'll take care of you we'll get you a settlement maybe but don't ruin this guy's reputation or the church's reputation and the regular people all kind of went along with it there's those few scenes where everyone's like you can't talk about this kind of stuff in boston that just doesn't fly and people are like the church gave me pressure, like, don't say anything. My friends gave me pressure. Everyone basically is complicit in this. And I, I didn't get that sense the first time I saw it, but it is textually in the movie. So do they say that specifically? Yes and no. I, I still think it, it does a good job giving everyone a fair shake with this, even if the journalists are portrayed maybe a little bit nicely but in defense of that choice like the journalists we see in this are doing good journalistic work you know they're not doing a smear campaign they're not running a tabloid they're they're doing a really good job and another thing that i didn't really notice the first couple times i saw this but i did this time a major part of the conflict of this is that they need to get this story right. They can't just tell it. They have to tell it in a way that doesn't allow the church or the lawyers or anyone involved in covering this up to be able to write it off and say, it's just one or two of them. We didn't know about it. They're proving like, no, here's how we know you knew about it. Here's how we know there are so many people doing this and why it kept happening. And and also like tied into that is that they can't let other papers get to this. They have to be very secretive about it. And like the Herald is maybe moving in near the end. And of course it is kind of the Herald's responsibility to also print this story. But that big loud, like the one kind of loud argument scene between Mike Resendiz and Robbie, they're both advocating a valid side of it that, you know, we have to beat the Herald to this because if they mess it up, then we're screwed and every all the work that we've done is basically for nothing and Robbie's saying no we don't have enough now if we go now they'll still be able to bury us maybe they just had that to be a dramatic scene in some ways but it's an important thing and I think part of the theme of this is also do your job well it's weirdly like kind of a way to like do social good is just do your job correctly that kind of feels like a point of the movie to me like the two people who are kind of at the moral center this of this are mitch garabedian and marty baron so we have schreiber and uh stanley tucci like they're the people who are like most committed to like doing this correctly and like this kind of ties back to the world of the story thing, but there's those few scenes where Robbie's friends are kind of like trying to to pressure him to like, come on, don't go forward with this. Like this is like, you're just going to rock the boat. Look at how much good the church is doing. And 
I love that line that he says to one of his friends. He's like, oh, this is how it happens, isn't it? Like, someone leans on someone else, and everyone just looks the other way. That, I feel like, is one of the most true lines in the movie. One one other, like, kind of subtle thing with it is, like, I think it's kind of saying, take victims and whistleblowers more seriously. It's not, like, screaming that. Garabedin and Saviano, the lawyer and uh, the first victim they talk to, some of the reporters kind of write off both of those characters. They're like, oh, Garabedin's a crank, he's paranoid. And then, like, oh, Phil Saviano's, like so annoying like he keeps coming at us he's trying to start a holy war whatever and both of those characters turn out to be right about everything and it doesn't give him like oh you were right scene like it doesn't like throw it in our face but textually it is there that like the people who they say were are paranoid at the beginning turn out to be right um did you have anything else for this nope okay And this is the last bit, and uh, then we'll be done with it. So, just to tie in with that theme, um, I don't usually get political on this show. I don't think I ever do. We never really talk much about issues outside of the movies or stories we do. I was planning to just do a regular analysis for this episode, but as I was revisiting this movie, there were a few things that I noticed that I couldn't really ignore, and I feel like I would be remiss if I didn't mention them. So, just to timestamp this, uh, we're recording on August 1st, 2020. That may not end up being important, but maybe it will. Even though the content of this movie is just focused on the cover-up of abuse by the church, I think this issue really is universal. There's so many elements of this that apply to other issues. Like, this speaks to things that have been brought to light by the Me Too movement, and especially... It speaks to some of the stuff that's been coming up with police shootings and Black Lives Matter the past couple months. Like, the term bad apples shows up several times in this movie in reference to priests. And it's been showing up a lot in reference to police lately. And recently, I also learned that police officers involved in shooting innocent people get reassigned to new precincts, just like the abusive priests do. And there's elements that run through both institutions that allow these things to keep on happening. And there's protections in place for people who do bad things that let them keep happening and prevent people who are responsible from being held accountable. It's not just about bad individuals, it's about power structures. And a lot of people will talk about like how much good the church and law enforcement does, but again, at a certain point, we kind of have to start asking like when does the bad outweigh the good and as i said before i don't know the answer to that but in both cases we're past that point now so i see this movie really as a call to believe victims of abuse and violence and it's not lost on me also that the victims of clergy abuse are predominantly white men which probably factors into why this got media attention like about 10 years before Black Lives Matter and B2 did, maybe with some change there. And in accordance with the It Takes a Village theme, I'm saying this as a reminder both to our listeners and just to myself. Like, when you see corruption, no matter who it affects or what it means for you, we should call it out. Because if we don't, we're letting it grow. So, like, part of why this abuse went on for as long as it did is because... The feelings of people who weren't affected were prioritized over the lives of victims, and that's absolutely still happening in other places. And I'll admit, I'm guilty of that. Like, there have been times that I've seen things and I could have said something and didn't, not with clergy abuse or police brutality, but with other things. And we need to stop doing that and call out corruption when we see it and hold people accountable. A lot of the causes for things like this abuse scandal are institutional, but a major cause is regular people just looking the other way. So I felt like it was kind of my responsibility to draw these parallels to things that are a little more relevant and even stuff that maybe we don't know about yet, um, even though that's not normally what we do on this show. And, you know, if that makes you uncomfortable, I had a trigger warning at the start of this, so you were warned suck it up (laughs) 
Um, yeah, um, th- that's all. Jelani, if you want to add anything, feel free to, but no pressure. Nah, you broke that down pretty well, bro. Black Lives Matter. I don't. I didn't really have anything else to add to that. You okay. Stole the show. Yeah, I felt like I <laughs> okay. talked a lot in this. Um, <laughs> I gotta take a sip of water. Hey, hey, bro, you killed it. Killed it. I don't know. I I felt like just you know, we're all about analysis and finding comparisons yeah, and like consider just, this analyzed yeah it it just it felt like we never really are i don't feel like we're in a position to do socially responsible things with this but i didn't want to pass it up so anyway so if you don't have anything to add to that uh we'll go to the boilerplate so next episode we are doing avatar the last airbender season three pretty yes, excited for that. boy Yep, I gotta start that. Circles I after that. Mm-hmm. Circle. Uh, I gotta Circles pick my next one too. I don't know what. It, I have an idea for it, but I don't know exactly, so I'm not gonna announce it right now. Do action. Action. <laughs> okay. I, I'll I'll pick. Please do something. I'll yes. do something a lot less not serious depressing. than this. <laughs> and serious. It, yeah, I won't. And real life. I won't pick anything. Yep. Yeah, I'll I'll pick something more fun. <laughs> you gonna pick like a slave movie or something next, Evan? Hmm. No, I mean you know me, Schindler's List. Following this up, uh, I don't really want to do Schindler's Christ. List. Christ. Yeah. Uh, in other news, I this will have been true for a few weeks after this, but as we're recording this, our Star Is Born video is up on YouTube. Uh, go check it out. Our logos by Kelsey Hendry. You can like us on Shut Facebook. Up subscribe rate and leave reviews on itunes that helps people those are important yo people don't realize how important reviews are i didn't realize that till my book was out but make sure you give this take like f- five seconds and give it a review just be mm-hmm. like good or something yeah decent like that the audience yeah, applauded de- gelati kelly is a funny guy you know the stuff like that <laughs> yeah even even you know even if you want to like critique that i hate things too much go ahead and put that in review jelani doesn't take movies seriously you can follow <laughs> us on twitter at int analysis 18 you can follow me on twitter at davos watson and where can people find you i mean i don't know why you would but if you want to follow me on twitter at jelani t kelly i'm there i'm on instagram at base phoenix and i'm on twitch occasionally now at J Base Phoenix. Yeah, so if that's all, we will see you guys next episode. Avatar. No Avatar. no more molestation and yep. religion. Bye. Yep. No more of that.